And here we go. We are back live on the internet. So I want to welcome you back to uh, our uh, Partnership for Opportunity and Workforce and Economic Revitalization. Ladies and gentlemen, and if I could please have your attention, we are going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Scott Hamilton and the Executive Director of the Appalachian Regional Commission. We have a great panel up here. What I would like to do as we get started here is I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, just who they are in the organization that they're with. Following that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and we're going to uh, commence the panel. So uh, we're going to start over here on my right. And again, just uh, to ask you to uh, give us your name and the organization that you're from. We're going to zip from right to left from the way I'm standing and then uh, Jeff will pick it up from there. My name is Bobby Lewis, and I'm the State Director for USDA Rural Development in West Virginia. Hi, my name is Hillary Bright. I'm here from the Department of Energy. How you doing? My name is Sterling Rideout from the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. I'm George Carrico with the West Virginia Brownfield Assistance Center. Dave Satterfield, West Virginia Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Hi, I'm Leslie Drake. I'm with the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, their international trade arm, which is the U.S. Commercial Service. I'm Russell Fry, and I'm with Workforce West Virginia. Thank you. Tracy Rowland from EDA and I are going to, I'm Jeff Schwartz, we're going to continue our little tag team here and talk about MATCH. As was mentioned in the first portion of this, the legislation gave us some money to invest in the region. It did not change the requirements of our grants processes. Both EDA and ARC require a matching contribution. And a lot of people, if you're not familiar with the grants process, you go, well, what is MATCH? And a lot of it starts when I get a phone call that says, you know, if I just had a million or two dollars, I could really do something great with it. And I say, start talking about, well, what is it you need the money for? What do you want to do with it? And they say, well, we need a couple of people, maybe some for travel. And I say, well, that's a, you know, for 10, 12 people. I say, well, no, 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 we have some people on board. We're going to do some traveling. We have some money for traveling. We need some more. We got to get six big widgets installed. We only have two of them right now. We need to get four more. And as we're talking, what happens is people start describing not just what they need the money for, but their entire program, the whole thing. And it starts looking a little bit like a budget. And it comes, comes out to look something like this, where, yeah, you need 10 people to do something. You need some travel money. But then you start looking at the resources you've got on hand, and you realize that while you need 10 people to do something, you have a couple of people there who are already working there or have the skills. You need more people, though. You may have a little bit of some equipment that you need, but you have to buy more. And when we look at that budget, it starts coming down to, well, we know that's the amount we need about two point something million dollars, but we already have a portion of that. And if you do the math at the bottom, it comes out to, well, we've got 23%. That's your matching contribution. And you've got your total budget over here. So depending upon where you are for ARC and depending upon what your status is for EDA, you may need more match to come into your budget. ARC does match by your county designation. If you're red on this map, ARC will provide up to 80% of the project costs. The other 20% must be from another source, not ARC. And that's why these folks are here, because they are not ARC. And ARC, we always, I know we all like to think of ourselves as special, but ARC really is. And that when Congress created us, they wrote a little something into our legislation that gives us the authority to increase the level of federal participation in grant programs. Which means 
that all of these folks, whether they're federal or not, can be counted as part of the matching contribution. And just about all of them, 99% of the other programs, can take ARC as their match. So with EDA, for many projects, if you make, can make the case for the need, EDA and ARC could match each other in a single application. So you can see up here, we've got five levels of match. You can see the maximum ARC contribution is here, and then the minimum required match level. So if you're in a distressed county, and you've got 23% match, you're a little bit over, that's a good thing. It shows you're doing all you can do. And that you're putting out everything, you, you're putting into it everything you have, all your resources. Joe mentioned that match for a technical assistance project could be in kind. Well, actually, ARC will accept in kind for a lot, but if you're doing a construction project, it's kind of difficult to get people to donate bags of cement and steel girders. So that's a little bit more difficult to come by, but think about match as the cash value of the resources being provided. Keep in mind the old saying, it takes money to make money. Well, it also takes money to manage money, and that's what the indirect line here is. If you're providing some of it, that's the match. That's your accounting services to manage the funds. The office space and the, the rent or the lease on the office space, the overhead costs, that's all in there. And then, of course, if you're getting a substantial increase to your funding, you're going to have some additional costs there that you're going to need to take out of the grant. But you can balance those out. That can be part of your match. And then Tracy is going to talk to you about how EDA works their match. Let me just caution you. The numbers look very similar, and the words look very similar, but we're from totally different places. Okay, um, the EDA match um, is, again, different. Uh, I get calls every single uh, week about how do you calculate the EDA match. Most of the counties in West Virginia are eligible for a 50% contribution rate. And in order to get a 50% contribution rate, your 24-month unemployment rate must be at least one percentage point greater than the national average. or the per capita income is not more than 80% of the national average. Either or gets you at 50%. And as you can see, it just as the board increases, the higher the percentage of an EDA contribution. I go to Stats America. Now, it's not always the most updated, but you can run a distress report under Stats America in two minutes. However, if you're not familiar with the site, and I know a number of people in here, I've sent them to them, you can contact me, I'll run your counties, I'll hit the average button, and I'll send you your eligibility for your basic EDA grant. Because we have two ways we do it. There's a basic EDA grant, and then there's a supplemental special need um, EDA grant. It comes all together. We go on and make you eligible for 50%, but then there's some additional criteria. There you go. Um, and this is where, um, in power, this is the same criteria that we use currently in our EDAP, Economic Adjustment Assistance Program, but under power, you're going to find so many of the counties will qualify based on the criteria I'm going to mention here. Closure or restructuring of industries or a loss of a major employer essential to the regional com economy as defined by, a couple ways of doing it, the actual closure or restructuring of a firm, even though it says of a firm, it can be of an industry such as the coal industry, of an industry within a 12-month period prior to the application submission, resulting in a sudden job loss and meeting the dislocation criteria defined here. And that is basically for, and then there is uh, actual or threatened closure, results in a sudden job loss meeting the following dislocation criteria. For regions with a population of at least 100,000, the actual or threatened dislocation is 500 jobs or more. For regions with a population up to 100,000, the actual or threatened dislocation is 200 um, jobs, um, or 1% of the uh, workforce. But you won't have any problem with the warn notices in the state. If you're a coal-impacted community, I think Mingo County, we were working with them last week on some eligibility, and I think we had 1,700 jobs. 
you know, or warn notices that have come out. So you, and then you, again, if you don't have coal impact, but you have manufacturing impact of an industry that served the coal industry, um, you know, 57% job loss in region one in Mercer County, they didn't have the coal impact, but they had the related um, manufacturing decline that, you know, for industry that was dependent on the coal industry. So just work with, you can use newspaper articles, you can use the West Virginia Workforce website, uh, we will work with you to help you assemble your eligibility. And that will take you up to uh, as much as 80% contribution rate by EDA. Um, you can have your basic 50% eligibility, but if you meet this criteria based on job loss in your county or your region or your project area, our contribution rate could go up to as much as 80%. Thanks. And Tracy, how often are your numbers updated for purposes of figuring out the match rate? Are they updated annually, monthly? Um, just whatever is the, on the, we use Stats America, basically. And whenever those are updated, I think every quarter. Um, but again, we can, if, if Stats America doesn't make your project eligible, but more current census information does, we will work with you on the more current census information, because that runs a little bit behind. Okay. ARC data is updated annually. And so you need to, right now for this year, you need to go for FY16 data you need to look at those classifications. How do you work, how does EDA work it with a multi-county region? Just take the overall average? Yeah, I can, you can actually go into Stats American and add up to 255 counties and it'll give you the average. You put every single county that's in your project, it can go across state lines. I just did the calculation for a project that served Virginia and um, West Virginia and you pull it out and it'll average it. Again, it's a little confusing, only the first time, call me, I'll walk you through it or I'll send it to you and then you'll have it. And that's probably the one place where I think ARC is a little bit more complex than EDA with our bureaucracy. We have a little formula. It's not always a straight mathematical average. Rather than put my, my math teacher hat on, which I haven't worn for a number of years, I'd refer you to the FFO. It describes for multi-county pro projects how you calculate the match. I encourage you to contact James Bush. He knows the West Virginia counties and can probably give it off the top of his head. Call me or contact power at arc.gov and we'll help you with that mix of counties determine the match, but it's listed in the FFO. All right. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Lewis and step out of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'd like to thank uh, ARC and EDA for sponsoring this uh, get together today, Earl and uh, Tracy and all the staff. Um, most of you all have utilized, I hope, our programs. We have 42 programs at USDA Rural Development and all 42 of them are part of community and economic development, whether it's housing, whether, it, whether it's a business loan, whether it's a education facility, healthcare facility, uh, police car, fire truck, city halls. Um, it's just uh, unlimited and uh, it all comes together. Uh, we could actually use all of the programs to build a community, but we can't do it ourselves. So we have to have partners like most people and uh, spread the wealth around. Our funding has been pretty consistent over the last few years. Um, but I'm not sure, I know the, our programs can be included in the power initiative, our regular programs. Um, whether or not the grant money can be used as a match or not, uh, I think Jeff said ARC doesn't have any stipulations on it, but I'm almost sure EDA does with other federal funding. Tracy? Right. Yeah, I know the loans can. Um, and the grant that we have, except for infrastructure, is pretty minimal. But don't get discouraged because we've done a lot of projects. I mean, we've even, I mean, if you have a project that includes community facilities, for instance, if you're in an area where you think there needs to be more drug treatment clinics and, uh, or healthcare facilities or education facilities and you want to include that in your regional uh, application, our loans can be used as match to EDA. 
but if there was a small grant to go with that, that could be in the project, but it wouldn't be counted as match. So you could utilize all of our programs in, uh, in your application. Uh, also, uh, Tracy, I'm gonna let you borrow my readers the next time. Uh, also, uh, Congress in 2014 uh, passed a section 6025 uh, bill in the 2014 Farm Bill that enables Secretary of Agriculture to provide pr priority projects that support strategic economic and community development plans. The result of that precision, preci provision called Strategic Economic and Community Development is referred to as SECD. Go figure what you want to call it. <laughs> SECD. Uh, and the purpose is to advance projects that support long-term community and economic growth strategies that both reflect multi-jurisdictional stakeholder collaboration and capitalize upon the strengths of the rural area. Now tell me how many buzzwords were in that sentence. <laughs> So by creating a regional focus and increasing collaboration, USDA resources can have a larger impact, enabling greater wealth creation and quality of life improvements. Now the money that they set aside came out of our regular money. So there's a 10% set aside in about five or six of our programs that uh, applications that meet that criteria are eligible for uh, extra points, priority, pri priority points, which could help in a project uh, to get funding over uh, another applicant. So you wanna keep that in mind. Uh, the, pro the programs that are included in that farm bill are the uh, rural business enterprise uh, I mean, rural business, rural development grant program, the uh, business and industry guaranteed loans, the community facilities grant program, and the community facilities loan program, and, uh, and then our water and wastewater programs. So if your application, any application that would meet that criteria could be transferred into that set aside with priority points to help fund the project. Um, with that said, we don't have a whole lot of grant money, that's why we have EDA and ARC, but we do have tools and I for one, when I hear loan, when I have no capital to borrow money and the community has no capital, then I sort of say, oh, if I can't get a grant, it can't happen. But a 40 year, three and a half percent community facilities loan from the government to a, a nonprofit organization uh, or a community, you know, local government can work similar to a grant in some instances. So don't rule out using our loan programs in your projects for match and to develop the communities because we do have the funding it's just sometimes it's loan and most of the time it's loan there's a little bit of grant but thank you and we'll answer questions later i told you when i mentioned there wasn't no grant nobody clapped <laughs> everybody my name is Hillary Bright and I feel like a lot of us will probably have that similar line um, I work for the Department of um, Energy in DC I grew up in in central Pennsylvania though and was introduced to your great state by my very proud mountaineer boyfriend and have had many vi visits to Morgantown and around the, the beautiful place that you all have the opportunity to live um, and I'm I'm really happy to be here today and try to figure out if there are any ways that the department can leverage resources and technical assistance and our expertise as you all are going through a very significant transition in energy. Um, 
the department works on sort of a host of different opportunities, um, and I think I'm up here mainly, so if you have I ideas and questions about anything related to, to energy, um, that we have some of the technical assistance programs can offer feasibility studies depending what the project is to help with some of the match funding you all may be thinking about. Um, so again, unfortunately, we don't have huge pools of money um, similar to EDA and ARC, but we are here to try to support you in all of your efforts related to energy as you're developing power um, applications. And another note I'll throw out, even if energy is not a part of your power applications, but you're working on it in another avenue, all of these resources are available outside of this specific power process. So just keep that in mind. If, it, if a light bulb goes off somewhere else, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And I'll just run down a couple areas of work that we focus on um, to give you an idea of, of what we can potentially offer. We work on sort of two different platforms of retention and generation. So as you all are looking at whether it's the closure of, of coal mines or a closure of power plants, we're really looking at trying to find ways to shore up some of what you have and retain the jobs that currently exist, while at the same time then helping to identify opportunities and grow opportunities that can potentially create jobs. And a couple of those areas, so we work, we're energy agnostic at the department, so we cover technologies on everything from coal to sort of traditional solar and wind renewable energy and a little bit of everything in between. Um, so for instance, um, we do a lot with advanced coal use. Two of the main sectors there being potential retrofits for carbon capture utilization and storage of existing power plants in the state. Um, and then we're also doing a lot of research and has, have found some pretty interesting opportunities on actually collecting rare earth minerals. So anyone who has a cell phone, anyone who has a hybrid vehicle, those batteries all require rare earth minerals, most of which we get from China. We're now finding those actually in old coal deposits and a lot of the waste coal as well as um, abandoned mines. So now we're looking at those opportunities to how do we utilize some of that waste to actually create a product that's incredibly valuable that can potentially bring back some of the jobs to these areas and also get us maybe off of some of the reliance on, on rare earth minerals from China. Just an example of, of one of the things that we're doing sort of in advanced coal. Um, another area that we do a lot of work is uh, light weighting of vehicles. So we do a lot of um, automotive work and one of the opportunities we're seeing and we've seen a lot of growth in Kentucky in partnership with the Aluminum Association is the manufacturing of these light weighting materials. Um, We've seen a lot of this growth, like I said, in Kentucky. Ford has done a lot of work in the area, but these kinds of supply chain opportunities that we're seeing are where we work with our MEPs, work with a lot of the other partners to try to figure out are there manufacturing opportunities on some of these newer advanced materials that can help get folks into the space. And manufacturing, as I'm sure many of you know, is really dominated by small and medium-sized businesses. So there are opportunities, I think, for small business growth in that space, both in the automotive, but also as we're looking at the growth in renewables on that supply chain piece. And how do we work with our partners then to look at exporting to other areas, to really being able to figure out where those markets are. DOE has a lot of the technological, technological expertise and some of the best practices where this has happened nationally and in partnership with, with all the folks that are sitting around us and would be happy to talk to any of you about ideas you may have, general questions. And again, a lot of this work can be done where we can at least offer the baseline feasibility to have those conversations and figure out what the opportunities are. And again, that can be used as match. Um, the last piece I'll throw out um, that we'll actually be talking about, the two gentlemen sitting beside me will touch on it a bit, but as you're looking at abandoned mine land across West Virginia, there have been a lot of studies that DOE has started to do on the utilization of those for both wind and solar. Depending on the kind of scale and things you get, you also can start then building out some of these industry clusters on the supply chain to be building those type of, type of projects. Um, but those are all kind of the ideas that DOE has really seen taking hold across the nation and some of the expertise and opportunities that I think we can offer um, as you're thinking about sort of an energy transition, both on, on ideally hoping to continue to generate and export energy, as West Virginia always has, uh, but then also those, those manufacturing opportunities, I think, really supply some of the good family-sustaining jobs that we're seeing lost in, in the coal mines and from the power plants. So if any of this sort of rings a bell or sets a light bulb off, please don't hesitate, grab my card, and I'm happy to have a conversation and, and figure out if there's anything we can do to be helpful. So thank you very much, all of you.
Good afternoon, all. Glad to be here. Glad to see everyone, see everyone here. Um, we kind of in a unique situation. Uh, my name is Sterling. I work for the Department of Interior Office of Surface Mining and Reclamation and Enforcement. And we have an AML, what we call the AML pilot program. We just received that money, you could say, recently in December. And it's $90 million for three Appalachian regions, um, states, West Virginia being one of them. And part of the program is cleanup of abandoned mine land um, sites, those coal mine sites that were abandoned in pre-1977, and then also having what we call a, a nexus, which is the economic and community development piece. So I'm here today to say reach out to the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection because the way it works is our grant money is not competitive grants. Our money we allocated to those states. Those states work with the various stakeholders to um, partner and, and, and have what well, I say the AML side, the cleanup, as well as have that community and economic development side. So it's a kind of a broad range to, to have those stakeholders as well as the state of Virginia, I mean West Virginia to work together to get that done. And so you can leverage money if it's ARC money, EDA, USDA. Uh, we don't have a, because OSM or the uh, federal government doesn't have a, a match for this AML pilot money. But you know, ARC, th those partners that you're working with may have some kind of um, variability how to, to deal with that kind of money. So I'm just here if you need to reach out to me and, and have a discussion. But one of the goals, we just wanted to make sure that the state of West Virginia, as well as those folks who are community and economic development, those local folks are at the table because they're at the stage now that they're developing their projects for this AML pilot money. And it's $30 million. It doesn't have a time limit on when it can be spent. And so I, I would encourage you all to definitely reach out to your state counterparts, the AML program, to get that done. And if you have any questions, um, I'll be around and um, I have a card so we can have that discussion. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm George Carrico with the West Virginia Brownfield Assistance Center at Marshall University. My uh, fellow compadre, Patrick Kirby, is unable to be here today, so uh, I won't sing and dance the way he does, but we'll try to give you a, a, just a few comments. First of all, we are not from the EPA, I'm happy to say. Um, and uh, uh, but I was asked to talk about the EPA Brownfield program and the set aside money for West Virginia. Well, there is none, so I guess I'm done. Uh, it is a nationwide competition for that funding. Now, here in West Virginia with our Brownfield Centers, you know, we're working with communities all over the place. I know some of you here, we've, we've worked at some of you have, actually have uh, EPA grants uh, right now. So uh, for those of you that, are, that, that aren't aware, and you folks that are from other states, so uh, this also applies to you as well, you know, there, there are a variety of funding opportunities through the EPA Brownfield Program. And yes, surface mine lands and anything related to the coal industry is by EPA definition a brownfield. So we don't have to worry about that. And we've really stretched that definition quite a ways. So um, the different types of grants that are out there, there are, many of you might be familiar with assessment grants. We need to qualify, that's environmental assessments. I see some of the other talks that they talk about doing assessing work. This is strictly for environmental assessments looking at properties that may have environmental impacts, whether it's asbestos in a building, something in the subsurface, something in the groundwater, whatever it might be, to try to address that as part of your, your uh, uh, redevelopment of those properties. Uh, there are a variety of assessment grants. I won't go into those details. I think the next round of applications will probably be due around uh, uh, late, uh, uh, later this year, toward the end of the year. There's also cleanup grants, and we need to qualify that. Again, it's strictly for environmental uh, related aspects. We can, uh, Patrick and I get calls every week. We need money to demo this building. Well, maybe you can get the money to take the asbestos out of the building, but if you're just going to go knock down some steel and concrete, you, very, very rigid guidelines here. You cannot use this funding for that. So a cleanup grant doesn't mean we're cleaning up the whole site. It's taking care of those environmental impacts that, that are there. By the way, the assessment grants don't require any match money. The cleanup grants do require 20%. Uh, there can be some, some stipulations there that, that you can work with. Uh, another type is, uh, and we do have several existing 
assessment and cleanup grants going on right now in West Virginia and in the other states that are here today as well. Uh, Area-wide planning grants, another one. Um, we just had a public meeting last night in Huntington regarding uh, what they're doing there. And that's just what it sounds. It, it's it's uh, identifying a particular area and developing plans to address those high priority brownfield sites. Those ones that are in the right locations that can be redeveloped for that, that next use. And um, uh, again, we've got a few of those that are ongoing now. That, by the way, that particular grant opportunity, uh, EPA says the next round is coming up in the spring of 2016. So uh, hasn't been announced yet, but <laughs> hopefully it's pending. Uh, that particular grant, by the way, is part of a partnership, uh, the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. It's a uh, partnership with HUD and DOT and EPA. So uh, it, it's an interesting uh, 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 grant that you might want to take a look at. There's also a revolving loan fund. Uh, uh, I know Ohio has one. I'm not sure about some other states. West Virginia does not. We have an application in right now with our state DEP for one. And that is, again, uh, low and no interest loans for environmental projects uh, that, that, that you may have on a site. Finally, there's also a uh, environmental workforce development and job training grant. And uh, there's, uh, there, there's one ongoing now that we've partnered with some folks on. And again, but again, it's specifically for environmental training, people that are going to go to work in the environmental industry. So there, there are some fairly tight guidelines that, that we have to, to, uh, to, to work with there. Best thing I could tell you is I know they've been talking about the ARC web thing. Uh, uh, if you just look up uh, EPA Brownfields, there is a plethora of information on what's available there. And then, uh, of course, here in West Virginia, I can't go outside of the state with, with, with that piece, but uh, we're, we're here to help you to put those grants together and those applications. Um, I would, a couple other thoughts here. Think of the Brownfield program as a potential piece of the redevelopment pie. It's, it's only one little piece of it. There's all these other aspects that, you're, that you folks are talking about. But if you do have an environmental issue, we always tell people, if that site's the best location for whatever it is you're wanting to do, don't let that environmental hurdle stop you. Uh, let's figure out how to deal with that issue and, and, and get it to the next level. Um, if, and I've got to put this plug in. If you're really interested in brownfields, our, our next uh, state brownfield conference is in September in Charleston at the Charleston Marriott. And unique this year, uh, day one will be our West Virginia State Conference. Day two, we're actually going to have it's the very first one. We've, we've uh, partnered with EPA Region 3, 4, and 5. And it's going to be the uh, very first Central Appalachian Brownfield Summit. Uh, if you go to WV Brownfields, that's with an S, wvbrownfields.org, we just put up the registration, and uh, uh, we'd love to see you in Charleston uh, in September. I'll be around this afternoon. I've uh, got a few folks I need to talk to, but uh, I'm here all afternoon to, 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 to be able to help you out. And uh, he's got the money, and <laughs> we're, we're going to hold him down, and we're all going to get it, all right? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Dave Satterfield, and I'm the Director of Asset Development at West Virginia University, and, uh, and uh, part of my assignment is the West Virginia Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Well, we are a federally funded resource. We're not really a funding partner, but we do see ourselves as your partner, and we want to help. The MEP program is a 60-center network that covers the entire nation. This started 25 years ago, and in the old days, as we started, what we wanted to do was, was the federal government said, the large, large, large companies in America have great engineering talent. The mom and the pops and the small and the medium enterprises, to be able, they need to be able to compete on the same basis and have some of the same talent and get, get access to resources so that they can compete and they can work on things in a better way from an engineering perspective. And that's how that program was born. So what had happened in the old MEP, we worked and we still work on lean processes, layouts, OSHA regulations and, and compliance. We work on things where we may be doing quality work, ISO regulations and certification that you know. And we do many things like that in the industrial engineering realm. And that basically you should think of us as the shop floor engineer that you don't have to pay for all the time. We're an engineering consulting group that's based at West Virginia University, funded by the federal government, and we did that for a long time. 
Today's MEP in the West Virginia MEP, we work on top line resources as well. And so what that means is we help map supply chains, we help look at innovation, we look at product development, we help with exporting, we look at trying to repurpose products you might have, repurpose services, making sure that your business is operating effectively, making sure that the business transition and secession plans are in place. And there's many things that we can do to try and help you and your community within this uh, ARC EDA opportunity. We participated a little bit with the Southwest, Southwestern Pennsylvania Power Grant this last fall, and what we will be doing is mapping the supply chain. What happens is, is Waynesburg, Green, Fayette counties in Pennsylvania, they were seeing the coal impacted communities as well, and we were seeing a lot of the workforce lived in the four counties, four, four counties up in north central West Virginia. So we will be helping with workforce development activities, we'll help with supply chain activities. Probably one of the most important ways I can help you in understand what we do as an MEP is to give you three brief examples about things we've done with firms that had supported coal mining. The EDA and the ARC, my ARC colleagues, have, have talked about there's mining is direct impact, but there's also those manufacturers that support the logistics, the transportation, those supply chains in the coal mining sector. So three examples that I can give you is how we repurpose and things we could help you with. First is a, is a southern West Virginia manufacturer. We did two things. We helped them with their plant layout and their processes, basically taking those steps out, making sure that they're as effective and efficient as possible to save them money. By the same token, we saw that what they were manufacturing actually had very, was very similar to some of the component parts in wind turbines. Working with the Blue Green Alliance, we were able to, to try and help them get their parts redeveloped, repurposed, so that they could be used in a new customer segment in a whole different economic segment. The next one would be a, a mid-state company that worked to, to work on how methane is used or abated in mines or controlled in mines and that sort of thing. When we started to work with them, they had new ideas about projects, we were, about products. We were able to help them figure out what the new products should be, how to design those new products, and then test them. What they've started to do is anywhere where methane gas is present, they're trying to find ways to make sure that it's handled in a safe and efficient way, try and use it as a fuel source, and trying to make sure that particularly this small manufacturer with eight people had a tomorrow, had a new customer, and that sort of thing. So now they're working in new segments as well as just the mining segment. The last one I'll talk to you about was one that, that was a, a North Central West Virginia company and is a North Central West Virginia company that had a number of years helping. Uh, they were sort of a heavy metals company, a fabricator, a group that, that was in the coal mines and they helped with the transportation, with the cutters, with the blades, anything that you would do that would be steel-based. And they, they had had a great run with coal mines, but as, as coal started to dwindle a little bit, they were able to, we were able to work with them and realize that in the, the exploration and production part of the shale supply chain, that they would be able to effectively compete there, and indeed, by taking their ISO certification, turning it into American Petroleum Institute certification, we were able to help them get a master contract. They still love their, their coal guys, but they were now able to work in the shale gas exploration production side. They were able to add about 200 people during the, during the boom a couple years ago. Those are ways I think we as economic development professionals need to look at repurposing our supply chain, repurposing our communities, our local mom and pop manufacturers in those communities. Coal was a very, very vital part of our economy for years. We need to do everything we can to try and help keep those manufacturers vital for tomorrow. And that's really what the MEP does. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Leslie Drake. I'm with the U.S. Commercial Service. And we're a fairly small agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce. I'm with their International Trade Administration arm. I could give a 40-minute presentation just on what we do. Um, and probably another 40-minute presentation on some events we have coming up. But since I have like four minutes and 30 seconds now, 
Um, my best uh, description of what we do can actually be found over here on this table. I kind of commandeered that, that table over there and put about six flyers on it, so I invite you to grab one. Export.gov is our website. And just real quickly, our agency is spread out um, all over the country. We have field offices. Um, I think we have about 70 field offices in the U.S. There's only two in West Virginia, um, just myself and then my colleague up in Wheeling, Diego Gatesco. Around the world, though, we have 140 uh, offices spread out. Um, just about every country, there's an embassy or a consulate, which gives us this great international footprint. So to tie this into why why you're here and how we can help, um, just to build on what, what Dave was saying about these companies they've worked with. Um, as you add companies, and I'm jumping ahead here, I'm assuming your grants are successful and you're bringing in companies and you're developing these industries, um, we want to keep them strong and we want to keep them profitable and we want them to hire more and more people. So exporting and developing their capacity to export and opportunities for them to engage in international trade is a huge piece of that puzzle that will you know, complete this picture for you and to keep them viable, strong companies. Export growth, um, companies that are strong in exporting typically pay higher wages. Uh, they're able to smooth out the sales cycle uh, where there might be opportunity in one part of the world um, or in a particular industry that might have been phased out here. Coal mining is a great example. We have wonderful coal mining equipment expertise in West Virginia, and coal is still being mined in places around the world, although at different rates. Um, we do help our, our mining equipment companies find these international opportunities for sales, and even for different types of mining as well. So there are these great opportunities, and what our agency does is we have no money. Let me say that, first of all, and I apologize for that, but we do have services. So we are able to connect our West Virginia companies that you're working with and that you're growing with international buyers. Um, we're an international sales team. Uh, we use our resources overseas and have very reputable contacts for our West Virginia companies to start doing business internationally. Um, having said we have no money, I do want to call your attention to a program of um, my parent agency, the International Trade Administration. They do have a program called the Market Development Cooperator Program, MDCP. It awards up to $300,000 grants. I'm not a grant expert, but I'm sure all the folks here can help you figure out if that can be used as matching funds. Um, their website is export.gov slash MDCP. And I know um, there's a lot of good partnerships that have been formed with that to help companies export. A few other things. That very first slide, it's not up there anymore, um, when Earl was talking at the beginning, it had a photo of a, of, a, of a pretty country road. Do you remember that? And then it had like a, somebody doing something innovative, and it had a university, and finally it had a manufacturing scene. It, there were four pictures, and I thought whoever chose that was brilliant because you know, that represents four things that we can definitely help you with with the U.S. Commercial Service, because that road can be tourism. And you may not know this, but tourism is an export. So as you build a tourism community, we can help you find the tourists to come drive on that country road. Um, you know, these innovative labs, those are training grounds for even some of our international folks. Um, there are groups of international people who want to come to learn how to use what we are so good at. Um, and of course, as we innovate, our products are wanted around the world. I uh, just came back from Hanover Messe in Germany. 500 U.S. companies exhibited there. There's still a huge innovative manufacturing base in the U.S., and we need more West Virginia companies doing that. That third photo was uh, universities, and I think there's some university folks here. Bring in foreign students. Um, if you're wondering how to find them, then call us. We have programs to help recruit foreign students um, to your universities and colleges. And we're more than happy to work with you to do that. And finally, the manufacturing, as I mentioned, uh, you know, nothing beats it. So we can certainly work with you, um, like Dave said, and our existing manufacturers um, to help make them strong and help them find overseas connections. And I could go on and on, but I can't because we have another speaker and lunch. But please pick up a flyer, and I'll be around the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I want to thank the ARC and EDA for uh, inviting me here today. I also recognize I'm the last speaker before lunch. <laughs> That's an enviable task. I'm also known to be very long-winded, so that scares everyone in the room. <laughs> However, I felt that there's two good speeches, and both of them end in short. Uh, we talk about coal miners, and at Workforce West Virginia, whether you're a laid-off coal miner or whether your company has uh, supplies to the coal mines or whether you work at a plant that's coal fired the first place the individual comes when they lose that job is to see me so it's kind of a captive audience i don't have money to give out in grants but i have tremendous resources and i think uh, a lot of things that you can use for in kind tracy mentioned the workforce website it's workforcewv.org. I recommend you all put that down. You can find all those statistics that she was talking about there, and it's pretty easy to navigate. And if you have any issue, you can call us, and we'll, we'll take you through it and, and teach you how to do that. And um, I think Ann will tell you, we'll even pull reports for you at no charge. Um, In, in our labor market statistics piece, we can actually look, and you may need this when you're applying for your grant, we can find average income in an area, we can expand that to whatever uh, geographical location you're looking at. We can uh, look at the number of unemployed in that area, we can let you know how many of those were coal miners or coal related. Uh, we can tell you how many folks in that region are receiving unemployment. Uh, we can look up the demand occupations because, again, we, we really don't need to trade, train for jobs that aren't here. So, so these are all parts of what we look at when we apply for grants. At Workforce, we, uh, we provide individuals with, when they first come to us, one of couple things. One, and the first immediate short-term need is unemployment check. And, and that is available for a maximum of 26 weeks. So in 26 weeks, individuals have to determine what's the next step in their life and how are they going to get there. So also at that time, we offer training opportunities that are, are paid for either through our local workforce boards or through a national emergency grant we received. And we received $15 million just to use for dislocated coal miners. And we use that also for displaced homemakers. And uh, I'll tell you a little story in a minute about that. But we use that money, which possibly I, uh, can be somehow shared in the grant that you apply for as a, a match of some type. I'm meeting with Tracy uh, here in the next few days. But that, that is one of the things we have. We also have training allowance for the coal miners. It's not a lot of money, but it's $20 a day, and it's on top of their unemployment. So again, we're trying our best to get them trained and into jobs that are out there today. Um, one thing we also have is the war notices that folks keep talking about. We have them all. They're required by law to give those to us. So we have all the war notices on our website and we also have projections of projected war notices. Um, just for, uh, for an example, today, I checked yesterday, today in West Virginia, we have 3,000 coal miners currently receiving unemployment right now. That's 12% of everyone in the state that receives unemployment. 12% is coal miners. That's huge, that's huge. So that's only the ones in this group. That's not talking about last year and the year before and the year before. These numbers continue to grow. We also have OJT programs that are 
They're very successful, and we're using them quite a bit in the southern part of the state. And um, uh, one, one, one uh, business, I think, down in Mingo County put on an entire shift using dislocated coal miners on an on-the-job training contract. So these are things to look forward to because the grant is how do we get coal miners back to work? How do we revitalize these communities that are empty? They're empty. And we have to do that through some type of a job. Um, and another thing that we do on the, we also provide training, we provide the unemployment check, but our offices provide jobs. We refer people out to jobs. Largest database of employers and jobs in the state of West Virginia. All this is online. You can go to that website and look at it. You can see what's available and what's out there. I want to tell you three quick things and then we'll do whatever's next, but I'm the last speaker. Um, just three different things that I know that have occurred with coal miners that are totally uh, different from one another. The first one I met at the Huntington Mall at Barbersville and I heard him talking to a friend about I'm not going back, I'm not going back, I, they can call me back but I'm through being laid off. So I just happened to get into the conversation, that's how I am. Found out he was a coal miner and he was going to barber school. I, I told the governor the story and, and he was pleased and we kind of you know forgot about it. About a year, year and a half later on channel, well, I can't say it, on television, I was watching the news report and there he was. They were interviewing him in front of his barber shop. He and his wife both went and they opened up their own barber shop. So I called him uh, about a week ago. They're doing good. They're going to bring someone in to do nails and they get a tanning booth. And when his daughter's old enough, she's going to be the shampoo person. So that's just one way that we don't have to bring in a Macy's or a Procter & Gamble, we develop. Uh, the other one the governor used in his state of the state address, coal miner uh, was laid off from the coal mine, so he, he went to Putnam County and he, he opened up his little shop with the, uh, used the uh, small business development center through the development office and opened up his shop and started providing a, a service of working on tractor trailers. Well, in a short period of time, he'd hired three more of his co-workers who had also been dislocated and now they have a thriving business uh, and his mother works the office. So uh, again, that's a second thing. Now the third, the third one I want to bring up is a displaced, uh, dislocated coal miner's wife who was a displaced homemaker went back to school and now she is graduated and she's a nurse. So we have to look at what can we do, what can we do that's new. For example, I'm meeting with a fellow that would like to develop coding and train coal miners to write code. And is it successful? Yes, they've done it in one of our neighboring states. But in West Virginia, you can't do that if you don't have broadband. I know that several of y'all work in, the, in those areas. So. Having said that, I will be here uh, today. I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to talking with you. Let's give uh, one more round of applause for the panelists. Just a couple things right before we uh, do break for lunch. Um, I do want to go over uh, the schedule. The breakout sessions will start promptly at 1.20. Uh, the um, cluster and broadband breakout sessions will be on the other side of these two walls, and you can get to them by going this door or around the other way, but uh, the cluster and broadband, and there are signs on the doors. Uh, entrepreneurship and workforce are going to be over here in this room. Uh, right before the breakout session starts, they will uh, pull the, um, uh, the divider in so uh, we can have that divided. So uh, that, those two will be in this room. 
couple things to keep in mind. Uh, you've heard a lot of conversation about match and the federal dollars and, and, and just remember that with ARC it's very unique and it's a great opportunity that ARC funds can match with other federal dollars and in this you've heard us talk about matching with EDA or USDA or what, wherever but just also remember that that's unique with ARC. We can't, and you can't match EDA and USDA dollars. The other federal regulations still apply. It's just that Appal uh, the Appalachian Regional Commission has been able to, in our enabling legislation, to be able to drive more investment into the region allows uh, the ARC dollars to be matched with other federal dollars. It's not that there is something new being announced today that you can uh, match other federal dollars with other federal dollars unless it's just ARC. But also match, again, isn't always just uh, hard dollars. So you talked about services, and uh, services can be matched. So think about all of those uh, different opportunities that uh, we're able to, uh, to use as match. Uh, the breakout sessions, again, uh, will be coming up. And, and the breakout sessions are designed to talk about these opportunities. Uh, the folks that are going to lead them are going to talk a little bit about these topics. What we would love to see is the collaboration, you folks talking about opportunities that you've heard about. Had a little conversation out front, Mary, about uh, uh, competitiveness versus collaboration and uh, really what power is is about collaboration uh, we're not really trying to compete against each other in our projects we're trying to collaborate with our projects and so talking about your thoughts and ideas um, is a good thing in this scenario learning what others are doing it's interesting I saw an email the other day that said um, we need to get our power application this was from one state that said we got to get our power application in before this other organization gets theirs in because they're doing the same thing. But that's not how power works. Power is, if that were to happen, we would call the two and say, you two need to work together. That's about the collaboration. This is about taking a unique opportunity and taking those dollars, working in a collaborative effort to invest those to the betterment of the community that's been impacted by the downturn in the coal economy. So with that, we're going to break for lunch. It is back here. I believe what's marked is on the, on, on the containers. Grab your lunch. My, uh, all of our federal partners, again, in the ARC team, I ask that each of you sit at a different table. Let's use lunch as a networking opportunity to start talking to each other. And then uh, right before the breakout session starts, I'll come up and let you know we need to get to the breakout session. Thank you.